And off to the races we go. Louisville's Urban Neighborhood Mosaic. History, locations, and landmarks. So this is going to be kind of a general overview. One of the neighborhoods I'm going to do a deep dive in, but for the most part, I'm just going to glance over a lot of the history uh, of the neighborhoods, and you'll see why here in a second. Of course, the reason why we're here is the Falls of the Ohio, which were formed 10,000 or so years ago and predestined Louisville as a location due to the falls. And by the way, they're not really falls. That's a misnomer. They're more rapids than they were falls. They're not like Niagara Falls. They're more like rapids over two miles in length. And I'm not sure what happened with that. But anyways, here's an old uh, map of Louisville. And you can see it's a very small city. And um, Downtown Louisville used to be um, the, uh, a residential neighborhood. That was our initial neighborhood, was downtown Louisville. And there are only about four houses or so still remaining from those original uh, downtown neighborhood. We have the Brennan House, which is on 5th near Chestnut. The Howard Hardy House there on 2nd, also near Chestnut. The Old House, known as the Old House, there on 5th. And then, uh, of course, the Paget House, which was built in the early 1790s uh, down along the waterfront. Uh, so, uh, unfortunately, most of the early neighborhood of Louisville has been lost except for these last remnant homes. So, uh, what we're going to be doing this evening is focusing on what I call the inner beltway, the urban neighborhoods, not so much on the suburban areas here. Now then, the urban neighborhoods really benefited from the uh, streetcar system, which was developed in the 1860s. Prior to that, most people, again, as noted, lived in the downtown, immediate downtown area. But once they got the streetcars going, it really opened up, uh, expanded their horizons east, west, and south. They had a one mule car line that ran from downtown all the way out to what is now Central Park in Old Louisville back in 1865 or so and allowed people to migrate south. Um, and on, whenever you see these streetcars, whenever you see the one mule, that was for flat terrain, flat landscape. And when you see the two mule cars, that's for the hilly terrain. For instance, those were used primarily in the East End going up Frankfurt Avenue there, how steep that is. They needed two mules to pull, pull those streetcars up. So the um, streetcar system really started to assist in facilitating residents from moving away from downtown Louisville and then out into the other suburban areas at that time. So here's a uh, overall map of Louisville that I put together showing some of the neighborhoods. Now as I was mentioning, there are, and this is just an overview of, of neighborhoods, this is probably what, 30, 40 neighborhoods listed. We probably have 80, 100 neighborhoods. Depend, almost every little section of town has a neighborhood associated with it. And so today we're just going to hit some of the highlights of those. And like I say, one neighborhood, I'm going to do a deep dive in to kind of give you more of a flavor of how one of the neighborhoods is set up. This is a map of our neighborhoods, urban neighborhoods that I got off the city's website, showing all that. So let's start in West Louisville. I'm going to just hit these key um, neighborhoods to begin with, Russell, Shawnee, and Portland. There's a graphic showing all of the, the unique, uh, usually they call this the West End of Louisville, but they each one are separate little neighborhoods. You hear Park Hill talked about a lot. It was on the news yesterday with the pretzel factory that was coming into town in the Park Hill area. Chickasaw, Shawnee, Portland. Portland was uh, once a city, as some of you may know, and uh, it's Louisville's largest neighborhood. In fact, it's so large, I've always thought it should be broken up. It's just way too big of a neighborhood to kind of get your arms around it. Uh, and then uh, it was used primarily for steamboats coming up the river to offload, to get around the rapids there, the falls of the Ohio. They utilized that a lot. And then they shipped the cargo by land up to Louisville and then they loaded it back on steamboats to take it upriver or vice versa for downriver. Here's a uh, view. So you see where downtown Louisville is and the Portland district there is right along I-64. You see a lot of it as you're driving along there. Portland Wharf. No. 
some of the, uh, the street grid there of Portland. The Portland Museum. Uh, if you has anyone been to the Portland Museum? Oh, yeah, yeah, it's oh, fantastic. Yeah. It is. If you ever, it really is a great little museum. <laughs> uh, you name it, they've got it there. They're doing the Children's Museum, which Louisville should have done a long time ago, but they're doing a Children's Museum in one of the homes adjacent to it there. And uh, but the Portland Museum is a great place to learn more about that neighborhood if you've not been there. They have these little models of the Portland Wharf. A lot of the history, uh, Paul Horning was from the Portland area, or he went to Flagge, right Bob? Yeah. <laughs> Notre Dame and then Green Bay Packers. Of course, Jim Porter, the, uh, the giant, he was 6 feet 21 inches tall, which translates to 7 feet 9 inches, very tall. Of course, the U.S. Marine Hospital there, uh, they built, uh, the U.S. built seven inner marine hospitals to serve uh, the Ohio, Mississippi, and other waterways on the interior of the uh, United States. Fortunately, our uh, marine hospital is the last one that uh, exists. The only reason why is its boiler system fed the hospital, which was directly to the south of this. If it wasn't for that mechanical system, this likewise would have been demolished as well. It's currently vacated. They just received money to finish the uh, interior. Okay. Uh, they are going to uh, make the uh, 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 Family Health Center's administrative offices within the old Marine Hospital. And then the space up on the fourth floor where Family Health currently has their administrative offices, they're going to turn that into clinic space. So. Hopefully, maybe next year or so, we'll finally get this uh, project uh, finalized. That's great. Uh, shotgun houses, and we'll talk about that a little bit later, but a lot of shotgun houses, not only in Portland, but throughout the uh, neighborhoods, inner city neighborhoods. Another one there. We just have some phenomenal shotguns, and I will talk more about these when we get to Germantown. So the Russell neighborhood, it's a hu another huge neighborhood west of 9th Street, as you can see, north of Broadway. It's beautiful homes in the Russell neighborhood. Unfortunately, it gets a bad rap due to the, some of the crime that occurs in Russell, but it's really a fine neighborhood, a lot of great folks there. So anyways, we go from the downtown area, 9th Street right here, all the way over to the, uh, at the interstate there on the far west side. It's a huge neighborhood. Again, I think it should be broken up as well. It's just too large of an area. Named for Harvey Russell, he was an uh, educator, pretty well known uh, there. Uh, I got to know uh, Harvey's uh, history a lot. Uh, he fought the Jim Crow laws a lot back in the early 1900s. Uh, but, uh, so that's who the Russell neighborhood is named for. Again, beautiful homes in Russo. They rival anything that Old Louisville has or Cherokee Triangle. Just spectacular houses if you've been able to drive through Muhammad, West Muhammad Ali. <coughs> Here are some of the shotguns that in the Russell neighborhood that have been uh, restored recently. I've always loved this one here on the left, and they did a great job in restoring it. And uh, just recently, they just took these two shotguns and made boutique retail stores out of them. I love this project here, this house. I don't know much about its history or who originally built it, but a, a young couple has purchased it. They just got a major financial loan and they're going to restore this. Uh, they just announced it earlier this year. I, can't, I have to go by periodically to see how they're doing on it. But you can see what it looked like originally there in the upper left-hand corner. They've cleaned it all up. I think they said there's like over 50 windows in this, in this <laughs> house. Wow. And so it's going to take them a while to do it. Uh, in fact, that's the, the wife there. Uh, I don't see the husband. But anyways, young couple, and they're determined to get it done. So we're so grateful for them to do it. Public housing uh, is in the Russell area. Of course, this is an old photograph of Beecher Terrace. It's now been totally uh, revamped, and uh, slowly we're getting rid of that old public housing aesthetic. 
and more contemporary design. And again, the crime. Unfortunately, almost every night there's some sort of shooting in the Russell neighborhood, but it's very limited. Uh, due to, I won't get into some of the reasons for all this. But Russell is a huge area, and unfortunately it gets a bad rap when they say it's in the Russell neighborhood. Well, golly, Russell is almost its own city. It's so big. And, uh, but, but the residents are coming back. There's a lot of redevelopment going on there, and uh, looking forward to more success stories there. Here are some of the landmarks there in Russell, the uh, uh, West Chestnut Branch uh, Library. Um, this, I think, was the Russell School, a name for him, Harvey Russell, but that was a school building that's been turned into residential. Of course, St. Peter's Church there at uh, 13th and Jefferson. And then I just did this. This was one of my projects. It's a health care center in the Russell neighborhood, very modern um, health care facility. Okay, Shawnee way on the west side of town. Most of us know it as the golf course uh, neighborhood. So there it is. It's on the uh, borders of the Ohio River. The golf course with the uh, Sherman Minton Bridge beyond. So Shawnee Park and all is right over here into this section here. Some of the um, things. Is this Flagge? That's Flagge, right? Mm -hmm. Right? Got that right. <laughs> uh, Chickasaw, I think that's in Shawnee Park or Chickasaw. One of the two, the bandstand there. Some of the housing, bungalow homes are primarily in that area. But again, very nice housing stock. One thing I can say about Louisville is when you ride through these neighborhoods, I don't really see many slum areas, very hardly any deteriorated areas. For what it's worth, I feel safe in almost any hour of the day driving through these neighborhoods. I'm in there all the time. I've never had any issues. Uh, I know that we do have a crime problem, but uh, fortunately uh, we've got sound neighborhoods and we have a lot of good, strong folks there. So let's go into central Louisville. So we have old Louisville, Germantown, and the Highlands. So now that we just were in the, the west end of Louisville, now we're going into the central section of uh, Louisville. Old Louisville, of course, everyone hopefully is familiar with that, with all the Victorian homes there. It's not the best map of Old Louisville, but it's primarily bordered. You have I-65 coming through here on the east side of it, all the way over to 9th Street. And then somewhat, uh, I do say from Broadway on down, but most people started at Oak Street. There's a view of a... Um, Old Louisville here in the center part with downtown beyond. The uh, University of Louisville borders it on the uh, south side. And again, just spectacular uh, Victorian mansions there. Of course, everyone has gone to St. James Art Fair and seen all this. Uh, we have a lot of uh, people coming in from California buying these houses up. They may buy them for a million dollars and invest another million. Of course, coming from California, I've been told by several of these folks, well, that's cheap compared to California. <laughs> they, they love these things. So uh, they're still doing very well. St. James Court area, the fountain, and the Conrad Caldwell House. Okay, Germantown, we'll do a little bit more uh, explanation of the neighborhood here. So Germantown is an uh, inner city neighborhood bordered by Shelby Park, the Highlands, Snitzelburg, sort of in the heart, if you will, of, of Louisville. And uh, Germantown uh, uh, benefited from the German immigration back in the mid-1800s, 1840s, 1850s, where a lot of uh, Germany was going through a lot of economic strife at that time, and a lot of Germans came over at that time. Unfortunately, they were not very well welcomed. A lot of immigrants, uh, the Irish, the Germans, the Catholics, uh, the native uh, Louisvillians uh, did not care for all these immigrants coming in. So there was a major riot on August 6, 1855, where a number of immigrants were killed. I am so grateful we are over this immigration problem that we've got <laughs> in this community. We don't want to have to deal with this issue. Mm -hmm. Little joke there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> 
But anyways, uh, Bloody Monday is still infamous and a lot of people still talk about it. We have a great uh, video on our uh, uh, YouTube page about Bloody Monday if you want to know more about that. Again, beautiful shotguns in the Germantown area, shotguns throughout Louisville. So what is a shotgun? I'm going to call on David Ames here. David's a uh, historian, house historian primarily. And feel free to add, add lib for me here, David, if you'd like. But a shotgun is a very long, linear house that does not have any internal hallways or corridors. And the myth of the name shotgun is that supposedly you can pick up a shotgun and shoot it from one end to the other, right? It goes out the, Well, if you know how a shotgun works, that would never work because a shotgun <laughs> sprays pellets everywhere. It would just tear up a room. You would need a rifle. And even then, if you notice how the doors are arranged, you can never... My uh, grandparents lived in a shotgun, so I was very familiar with how they were laid out. Supposedly, David, correct me if I'm wrong, but I've heard that the shotgun uh, style came over from West Africa through the Caribbean into New Orleans, up the Mississippi, and into Louisville. So I'm not sure if you want to shed any more light on that, why it's called a shotgun. New Orleans was, had the most shotguns until Kakuna, and Kakuna hit the sixth ward in New Orleans and wiped out much of those shotguns, and then Louisville became the city with the greatest number of shotguns. And I always ask, who did the accounting on all that? <laughs> who, who counted all these shotguns? I hear that all the time, like, well, we have more shotguns than anyone else. Same thing with cast iron facades. We have the second most outside. Well, who did the accounting on that? I did track down the cast iron story once, and where that came from is someone put it in a book somewhere, and uh, that's how it got into being. No one actually went out and did a, a county of cast iron facades. On shotguns, I've also heard that um, they were, came about due to taxing incentives, right. due to the facade and all that. I've tracked that down, and David, I'm not sure if you uh, have any I have too. It's a myth. It's know. a myth. Total myth. It is. Um, the story is, however, that uh, <clears throat> um, Louisville tax our houses on the front feet of the house. And therefore, if you had a long, narrow house, you're only taxed on the front feet. And, and then the stories. And so that's why the uh, camelback comes from. Mm -hmm. The story of the camelback. Camelback then was another way of avoiding taxes, because you put the two story in the back of the house, so your house was only taxed on being a, you know, a little narrow one story house facing the street. But there's been no evidence. There of that. is no documentation of that. And I also found, I was, uh, someone wrote a book on Louisville. Uh, uh, back in the 1970s, and in there, that person put in that was based on taxes, right. and I'm like, oh, geez, that's wrong. <laughs> but, it, but it is a very affordable, uh, least expensive right. housing style <clears throat> that if you are trying to minimize your taxes, yes, that's the style you want because footprint is very small and, uh, and all. So, but anyways, shot, we have a lot of shotguns. Now, here's a good overview of Germantown. Look how many shotguns there are in the Germantown area. By the way, this white uh, building here, that's the Bradford Mills Lofts area. Uh, it's a mill building there, but look at, I hate to use the word mobile homes, but they look like mobile homes stacked in there. They're really like packed in there like sardines, aren't they? Mm -hmm. But you can get so many houses in such a small little area, very working class uh, area. My uh, grandfather worked at uh, American Standard. Uh, as, a, as a laborer, and so he could afford a shotgun. Again, very affordable housing design. And they've been renovated. Um, you can see some before and afters here. Before, after, before, after, what they're doing here. This is an interesting house here. Um, this is more in the Shelby Park area, but we think this might have been a uh, church at one time. The way it's configured here, David, I'm not sure what you think. It's kind of an odd-looking house. But a, a lot of the inner-city homes now are being re revitalized and renovated. No matter what street I drive down now, I can find a house or a couple of houses that have been added or renovated. There really is a renaissance going on in our inner-city neighborhoods. People are building new houses. Here up above, you see the vacant lot, and they put a new house adjacent there. Same thing here, vacant lot, new house. This house here, so you have a vacant lot, they put this modern house here. Do you all know how much? It wasn't they, vacant. It was not a vacant lot. So there was a house there that was demolished at some point. 
But well, anyways, it was, a, it was a vacant lot when they built that. Did they tear it down to build that house? They tore it down to build that house. Okay, well, that's not on Google Street Map view for what no. it's worth. They must have tore it down some time ago. It's in my neighborhood. Okay. Do you know how much that cost, that new house? They just sold it for 700000 That is correct. I heard seven fifty, but uh, seven hundred. dollars Well, it was on the, on the market for seven fifty, but they closed at seven hundred. So these houses in the inner city area, even shotguns now, are going for over hundred thousand, hundred fifty thousand, four hundred thousand dollars. I've heard uh, these homes. So, uh, but they're flipping them and uh, doing various things in the inner cities there. But yeah, a modern house. Who would have thought that happened there? These homes here. I don't know if these have sold yet, but same, uh, same thing. Here's an interesting house in Germantown. I was asked on a, on a walking tour one time what the history of this house is. It's obviously Italianate style with bracketed eaves here. I always know Italianate style because, David, here's how I remember. Long, narrow windows. It's the eye for Italianate with bracketed eaves. So who, who built this house? What's the story on this? Well, fortunately, a lot of neighborhoods have their own little history books. And we were able to find a, it's called Walk Through Germantown by uh, <coughs> Carolyn Aiken and Natalie Andrews, and Natalie Andrews of the Portland Museum. But uh, they wrote a book back in the 1970s about, and they included this house and the whole history of it here. But yeah, in the library here, and I'm not sure if you have it here, Beth, I know downtown they have a lot of the neighborhood history books, but there are usually books on almost every neighborhood Someone has written about them, and so if you want to know more about your specific neighborhood, I would go down to the Kentucky Room up on the second floor of the, uh, off York Street there and uh, talk to the librarian and see what you can find and, out. And I did order a few books that are on this. Ah, there we go. There. We got Cherokee yeah. Triangle over there and several of the others. Some of the other neighborhoods. So yeah. yeah. But yeah, usually there is a, someone has done a history of your neighborhood. And thank goodness someone did one on this house already, so we know what the history of it is built in 1882. And one other interesting thing that we found out is these uh, streets change their names and street numbers a lot. And golly, it's a, it's a, I, I do a talk on researching your house and it is a, uh, a maze, but the original name of uh, St. Catherine was Cane Street and then the, the, the number changed as well. Also in Germantown, they have a lot of mill buildings there. Uh, this was the cotton mill, the Germantown Mill Lofts. Very nicely done uh, renovation into residential. The Bradford Mill Lofts also. And then this one here, the Hope Western uh, Mill Company. It's primarily a, a artist lofts, I think. Uh, artist studios that are within there. Hopefully one day it'll be renovated into residential as well. But these mill buildings, once they outlive their once function, they've been repurposed into nice residential communities. Some other uh, landmarks in the Germantown area, St. Elizabeth, although this is actually in Schnitzelburg. Don't ask me the difference between Schnitzelburg and Germantown. They all kind of run Goss together. Goss Avenue. Yeah, Goss Avenue. East, East and West. <laughs> they all tend to run together. But uh, this is St. Elizabeth Church, designed by Fred Earhart. Fred was a German immigrant. There is the original design of St. Elizabeth wow. with the tires. Some of the history of him. He's buried in St. Michael's Cemetery, which is on the uh, southern border of the Germantown area. He also did the uh, Ursuline Chapel um, over there off Lexington Road. Oh, this was uh, St. Therese, sorry. St. Therese sort of popped that up sooner. But he also designed Ursuline Chapel as well. But St. Therese. So Fred, being German, obviously probably spoke German, knew the culture, and so mingled very well with the Germantown neighborhood, as well as the Ursuline nuns, Ursuline sisters, who were from Germany as well. So he did a lot of religious structures related to the Germans. He also did uh, St. Joe's Orphanage there off of Frankfurt Avenue. In fact, right here, he designed a building right here. What was here? I should have included it in my talk. Yeah. But there was an orphanage here. It was with the Protestant? Yeah, the Protestant. German, German oh. Protestant. Yeah, it was here. 
And he designed that building as well. It was very similar to uh, what he did over here for St. Joseph. Golly, that would have been a great tie-in if I remembered it. <laughs> but anyway, he talks about the Ursulines and all here. St. Joseph Catholic orphan picket, Nick, if you've been there, you've seen his work. So again, uh, St. Michael's Cemetery, which is on the southern border of Germantown. It's very easy to get around. It's not like Cave Hill Cemetery. Cave Hill is misnamed. We got one cave, many hills. But here it's very flat. You, you can get around fairly easily and not that large. I don't know how many acres St. Uh, Michael's is. I'm guessing 30 acres at most, maybe, or less. The old German part is really interesting. Yeah, and, and they have a lot of German. Uh, in fact, when we did a tour of it, uh, we had to bring along a German uh, person who could read German on the, on the headstones. The Ursuline nuns are buried there. And the most famous person buried in St. Michael's Cemetery is Victor Mature. There's his daughter right there. Exactly. His daughter, <laughs> Victoria, uh, uh, somehow she found about, out about our Louisville Historical League tour and showed up and gave a great talk about her dad and, and all that worked out pretty well. And he has that nice banner there in Shelby Park area. Now again, I think this is more Schnitzelberg than Germantown, but the Hawks or Hawks um, and the Dainty. Has anyone been to the Dainty? Okay, some of some of you've seen the Dainty competition. I've not been there, but uh, I think they still have it going. I know Hawks. Oh yes, it's still still going what on. Is it? How many years has it been going on? Does anyone know? And don't ask me to describe what a dainty is. I, <laughs> but it has something to do oh, with a little God. piece of stick. You smack on the ground, you hit it, and it's similar to baseball, I guess, or something. The anyway. street there is lined off. Oh, is it? For, the <laughs> For how long the, the dainty yeah. has to travel. Of course, uh, perhaps the, the best the iconic thing in Germantown is Czech's Cafe. Everyone hopefully has been to, to Czech's. It didn't start out as a restaurant, though. It started out as an A&P oh. grocery store. So uh, back in the 1930s. So that's a little deep dive on uh, one of the urban neighborhoods. And you can almost do a similar talk on almost every neighborhood in Louisville with a similar sort of theme going on with the, with the worship places, the churches, the restaurants, the housing types. The cemeteries, we have cemeteries throughout as well. So Highlands, a neighborhood which we're in right now. The problem with the Highlands is everyone thinks they live in the Highlands here, it seems like. Whenever I ask someone in this area, where do you live? Oh, I live in the Highlands. Okay, what part of the Highlands are you in? <laughs> we'll discuss that. So basically the Highlands goes all the way from Broadway, which is known as the original Highlands. Then you go to the, the Douglas Highlands, and then you've got the Upper Highlands. So you got a lot of, and then even, I think the people in between say they're in the highlands as well. But uh, I love that graphic there that's on Highland Avenue uh, at Baxter and such. And some of the housing stock there, they have shotguns and they have a very eclectic mix of uh, residential structures there. Um, in fact, I've got two James Gaffney designs here. I didn't realize I had that this is a James Gaffney, and those are James Gaffney as well. I'm not sure if y'all know who James Gaffney is, but he, and I don't know if I have a photo of it, but um, he did St. James Catholic Church over here on uh, uh, Bardstown Road near Eastern Parkway. But and also Unity Temple. Unity Temple, college. which was a, a synagogue when he designed right. it. And his house just got restored there on River Road, 4515 River Road got in my brain. They did a marvelous job of restoring his home there on River Road recently. But James Gaffney, of course, the, the iconic sculpture there, which was designed by Ewing Fahey. I'm not sure if you all know who Ewing Fahey is. She was a woman sculptor. She just passed away a year or so ago. But I think they had a competition for this, and she, she was one of the winners of that competition. She was a sculptor. Uh, some more images of uh, along Bardstown Road, the Bellwether Hotel, which is just a boutique hotel, which is fantastic that they did. Of course, a little bit farther in there, uh, Bristol Bar and Grill. 
great residential along Bardstown Road. So we've gone uh, west end, central, moving towards the east end here, some more neighborhoods. So we've gone west, central, now we're going east. Again, Butcher Town, a lot of shotgun houses, immigrants, and all very similar to Germantown. So uh, Butcher Town is here. You have New Lou, which has really revitalized this section of Louisville. Uh, they built a new soccer stadium here. Where a lot of things, Butcher Town is strategically positioned among all these great economic things that are happening and has really created a renaissance in Butcher Town in the last few years. Of course, <laughs> you know the reason. You know, it always amazes me that when people move to Butchertown, they go, what's that smell? <laughs> uh, do you know what the name of Butchertown is? And I heard a fact yesterday for the first time. I had never heard this, and you all correct me if I'm wrong. Do you know how many hogs are taken into that JBS por uh, pork plant on a daily basis? Do you all know how many hogs go in there? I was told 10,000. Oh 10,000 hogs a day go into that JBS facility. Now, there used to be a number of pork packing uh, facilities in the area. Of course, you had the old uh, Fishers bacon making facility there on Melwood, which is now the Melwood Arts Center where 1020 Brewery is now, 1020 East Washington, that was a uh, food producing plant as well. There were numerous, and JPS is just the last one there. But yeah, they treat a lot of hogs. I don't know how they get them all in there, but it's amazing. Of course, a uh, street scene there along Franklin or East Washington Street. And they're building new homes there as well. Again, I don't know if a house existed there previously or not, but it was a vacant lot when a Google Street View went through a few years ago, and they built this nice contemporary home. But the number of them, if you go down Franklin Street, a lot of renovation going on in that area. Here are the breweries that are in uh, Butcher Town. We have 1020 there in the upper left-hand corner. Whirling Tiger, which was the old uh, Butcher Town pub for us back in the 70s. <laughs> we hung out there a lot. Um, South, South Seas uh, Brewery, it used to be the old Hall Cafeteria. Oh. Yeah, and it's now this big facility. They got games in there and all that. And then, of course, Copper and King's uh, Distillery there along East uh, Washington at the railroad tracks. So uh, they still have breweries there in Butcher Town. Of course, the soccer stadium has made a great impact there. A lot of the people go to the breweries before the game and then after the game. Do a lot of good things there, soccer stadium. Um, I saw this poster here recently. I'm not sure where I saw this graphic, but it highlights all of the uh, iconic areas of uh, Butcher Town, St. James, not St. James, but um, St. Joe's uh, Catholic Church there, the shotguns and the breweries and all. There's St. Joe's there, built in 1866. Still going strong. I have scaffolding there in front. Fortunately, they redid the uh, steeples not too long ago. Thank you. Uh, boy, that was something to watch those people way up at the very top working on those steeples. Okay, Cherokee Triangle, again going to the east. There's a reason why it's called Cherokee Triangle, which we'll show here in a second. But again, very similar to uh, Old Louisville with its Victorian style mansions, very upper end. So here's why it's called Cherokee Triangle, because it's a triangular shape. You, know, you got Bardstown Road on the, uh, the west end there, you got Grinstead Drive, Cherokee Parkway, so it's kind of a triangular shape. And of course, we, oh, by the way, I wanted to mention there, in the middle there was the Castleman statue, their iconic statue. Which, again, not sure which side of the fence you're all on on this. I've been involved in the Castleman statue controversy for now going on five or six years. And everything you ever heard bad about Castleman was totally incorrect. He wasn't the, uh, the racist that he was. He and Harvey Russell were good friends. He befriended the African-American community. 
He, made, he kept the parks integrated. He did not segregate the parks. That was one of the big lies that was told about Castleman. They, oh my God, he segregated the parks. We can't have a statue for someone like that, right? Totally wrong. Yes, he was president of the Parks uh, Commission, and that's the reason why the statue was commissioned for him to honor his contributions to our park system. But he kept the parks integrated. When he died in 1918, parks were integrated. They were not segregated till 1924, six years after his death and eight years after he left the Parks Commission. He promised the African American community he would keep them integrated. He was friends with a lot of the African Americans and a lot of good things for them. And then why this whole misrepresentation came about, about his history, I can only I have no idea why that happened, but we've been fighting it ever since. We won at the Kentucky Supreme Court earlier this year, back in March or April, we won. The Kentucky Supreme Court agreed with us, it should go back. They said yes, put it back, totally uh, misrepresented why he was taken down. The current mayor has decided not to do that. We got him back in court again. It will go back to the Kentucky Supreme Court again. We will win again, and we will get the statue back at some point. But it's just unfortunate that they graffitied the statue in this manner. Again, 19 African Americans wrote a letter to the Courier Journal on July 4th, 1924, six years after his death, praising Castleman and his um, and his uh, uh, friendship with the African American community. And yet, folks do that to his statue. He was, uh, he, had, he was very progressive at the time. Yes, he did serve a brief stint in the uh, Confederate Army. He was just a major, two and a half years. He was captured, sentenced in prim, uh, prison, exiled, uh, almost hanged, various things bad happened. But he turned his life around. And for the next 50 years, he did that while he was a teenager, by the way. I'm sure you as a teenager never did anything that you <laughs> now regret, right? And he regretted it. He said that, that was a bad decision on his behalf going into the Confederacy. He renounced the Confederacy uh, and all. But um, anyways, 19 African Americans, including Harvey Russell and um, uh, James, James Bond and several of the other high-profile African Americans of the day, were very good friends with Castleman. And don't or, forget his wife was a suffragette. And he oh, helped yeah. with the cause for women's vote. He helped fund the suffragette movement. He was friends with Ian and Yando. Very progressive. In fact, so much so that the Confederate newspapers of the day, when he died, did not publish his obituary. They castigated him, did not like him. Can I ask a question? Yes. Um, if, if the statue is really valuable to a lot of people, why well, don't protect it somewhere safer than outside? Well, uh, we, we think it, it's been safe there for over 100 years. It sat there for over 100 years with nothing happened. In fact, the main support for returning the statue are the residents of Cherokee Triangle. Now, I will say this. We will put cameras on it. In fact, we know who were graffitiing in this. We have photographs of them graffitiing in this. But the, current, the past mayor would not charge those people for what they were his supporters for what it's worth. Mm -hmm. And um, so we know who were graffitiing in it. Uh, but anyways, um, but no, it would be safe, just like any other statue. Uh, Many statues ho ho are affected by acid rain now, so I would wonder mm -hmm. if, like... It it's sat there for over a hundred and some odd years. It was dedicated in 1911 or thereabouts, 1912. By the way, uh, Hogan's Fountain gets uh, graffitied a lot. You don't know about that, but they fix it all the time. Grace Hopper down on the waterfront gets graffitied all the time, and they fix it up. So we can do it. And by the way, there are coatings that you can put on these statues that uh, repel the paint. We would want them to put a coating on it as well. But anyways, a little history. I've got a little off topic here, but it, um, the Castleman statue is, uh, it's been noted as one of the best equestrian statues in the United States. And yet, um, we take it down and cast, and anyways, it's horrible. So there they are removing it. We will get it back. We will get it back. <laughs> one of these days. Of course, it's the, it was the symbol to uh, Cherokee Triangle, and then they changed it to this recently, to that symbol. Okay, Clifton um, neighborhood. I moved into Clifton in the early 1980s. My parents hated me moving there. They said, oh my gosh, your, your house is going to get broken into, your wife's going to get raped, all this bad stuff's going to happen to you. And now you go to Clifton, and it's one of the best neighborhoods um, in the city. 
<coughs> so anyways, here are some maps of the Clifton neighborhood, kind of hard to see. Some of the uh, uh, landmarks of Clifton, of course, the Kroger. What do some people call the Kroger the there? Dirty the Kroger. Dirty Kroger. <laughs> which it is no longer the Dirty Kroger, but it's, everyone knows what you're it talking about. <laughs> when you say Dirty Kroger, they know what you're saying. And of course, the old uh, firehouse is now the uh, restaurant yeah. there. Yeah. Um, uh, Kentucky School for the Blind, um, Irish Rover, a lot of Frankfurt Avenue uh, restaurants along there. Just really been. I tell you, when we moved into the area in the early 1980s, all this stuff was vacant. Nothing was happening. Uh, like I said, my parents were appalled. They lived way out beyond the Waterson Expressway. Couldn't figure out why me and my wife wanted to move to the inner city. And uh, now, I wouldn't live anywhere else. And, of course, the Kentucky School for the Blind is getting ready to do this major addition. I think they just did the groundbreaking on this recently. But it's called, they're going to house the Helen Keller Archives in this building. It's going to be a phenomenal addition to the Clifton neighborhood there off Frankfurt Avenue and State. Is it State Avenue or State Street it's in, the, in State that Street. area? But anyways, they're going to be building this here shortly. Crescent Hill neighborhood. There's an aerial photograph. Um, you see the Peterson Newman Hill House there, Peterson, Galt, uh, Barrett Junior High School there, uh, Franklin Avenue up above. That's the uh, Southern Baptist uh, Seminary there. The, the reservoir where all of our water comes from. Uh, anyone walk around the reservoir on a regular basis? Me and my wife do this basically on a weekly basis, go around the reservoir there. Um, this is St. Joe's Orphanage area, which I was just talking about, uh, Fred Earhart design. Peterson Dumino House. By the way, next, I guess next Thursday or so, I'm giving a talk here on the Lady in White, who is a uh, ghost that haunts the uh, Peterson Dumino House. That's another topic. Okay, St. Matthew's, uh, small little city adjacent to, uh, to Crescent Hill. City of St. Matthew's here, of course, I'm sure hopefully everyone's familiar with it. Shelbyville Road pretty much goes down the, the main spine of uh, St. Matthew's. So, Steve, that does not cross the waters, and right? St. Matthew's is all north. Okay. That is correct. It's pretty much to the north or uh, west of uh, the Waterson Expressway. It looks like some of it does spill over a little bit here, but the Oxmoor Mall and all is not in St. Matthew's per se, per this map here. So, why is it called St. Matthew's? Because of it was. Uh, the original name of it was called Gilman's Point, 1840. It was a stagecoach stop named after Gilman, who, who ran the area there at the point. But why is it called St. Matthew's? There's, there's Gilman's Point right there, which has that huge replica of Independence Hall, which that's another, I'll, I won't talk about that. <laughs> so why is it called St. Matthew's? It's because of St. Matthew's Episcopal Church. Mm -hmm. It wasn't anywhere near where St. Matthew's Episcopal Church is now. <laughs> right, that is correct. But yeah, but St. Matthew's Episcopal, the, the original St. Matthew's Episcopal was named for that back in 1850. So there's Gilman's Point there, uh, which is pretty much the cross section. You got Chinoweth Lane, you got Breckenridge Lane, you got Shelby River Road, and then you got Frankfurt Avenue. All those streets coming together right there. Westport Road comes into it also there. This is the St. Matthew's Episcopal Church, the modern version on the interior of it. Where was it originally? Uh, well, Shelbyville Road, just right to the east, somewhere around where that blue facade building is. There. I see. It was in there somewhere. Right in this area. It was area. somewhere in that area right there. Yeah, I don't think there's a historic marker there that no, says that. The, the, I looked it up. The church now is a new congregation that took the old name. Hmm. Hmm. Of yeah. course, isn't that lovely? <laughs> <laughs> and of course, if you know anything about the, this bank, they built these throughout the Kentucky. You go to, the, go to Paducah, you go to Owensboro, you go anywhere, and they've got similar designs. Okay. Of course, the Vogue Theater, our beloved Vogue. 
the last uh, picture show there in 98 or 99 is when they, they closed down. Um, one of the favorite um, restaurants there was called Pryor's Restaurant there on Shelby Hill Road near Hubbard's Lane. And then they turned it into an Arby's. Then they turned it into an automobile <laughs> facility. So, uh, so here are some photographs of um, the Mall of St. Matthews and how it developed back in the early 1960s. It's not like that today. It's grown mm -hmm. a little bit more. Mm -hmm. Believe it or not, a lot of these, this is an aerial photograph from, uh, I want to say the 1950s. A lot of these structures are still there. The, uh, Zachary Taylor M an American Legion post is still there. Of course, Shelbyville Plaza is still there. The freshers they just demolished. <laughs> it's no longer there. The bowling alley, I think, is still there. Yeah. Community yeah. center is there. The drive-in's gone. Driving range is gone, although they built Top Golf just a little bit to the east of there. And the uh, Baptist Church is still there. So a lot of this is still there some 70 years later. In the Mall of St. Matthews up there. And also in St. Matthews is our major health uh, care complex. Uh, we have Norton Hospital there, Baptist Hospital, big uh, medical facilities. So that was the east, so we've gone west, central, and uh, west, central, and east. Now we're, let's go to the south and southwest, complete the, uh, the loop here. Iroquois uh, Park area, Beachmont. So this is south of the Waterson Expressway. Uh, you have um, Southern Parkway, which sort of is the main spine through the Beachmont neighborhood. Southern Parkway there. By the way, the Parkway system really facilitated uh, the neighborhood connectivity as well, just like the streetcars did. So you have the streetcars, then the, the Parkway system. A lot of bungalows and things of that nature. Um, I think the bungalows, correct me if I'm wrong, David, came from India or someplace like yeah. that. Then you to California after the east. Yeah. So the bungalows are not a Native American uh, design either. Some landmarks there, shopping centers, Iroquois Manor <coughs> and all. Of course, the famous Colonial Gardens. Hopefully everyone's been out there to the restaurants. We horrible preservationists pres preserved it back about 15 or so years ago. It lo once looked like that. We said, oh, well, it could be fixed up. And sure, certainly they did. And it's uh, now a great uh, uh, restaurant there. They have three other restaurants as well. So uh, Colonial Gardens, we're fortunate to have saved that. Of course, the Iroquois Amphitheater and Iroquois Park. Go a little bit farther out, Valley Station, Pleasure Ridge Park area. It's more southwest of Louisville. Valley High School, Pleasure Ridge Park High School. Farnsley Mormon House. Hopefully everyone's <coughs> from Farnsley Mormon. Mm -hmm. It used to be one of the largest farms in uh, Jefferson County. I think they had over a thousand acres at one time, if I have that right. Not so much anymore. Some of the uh, housing stock in Southwest Jefferson County, a lot of ranch style homes, uh, mid-century modern, 1950s, 1960s style homes. Dixie Manor is their main uh, shopping area there, along the wide, wide Dixie Highway. Dixie Highway once was known as the Motor Court capital of <laughs> Louisville. <laughs> They had over 20 motor courts, or motels, is another term for them. Here are some of the more famous ones there, the Alamo Plaza, the Churchill Inn, and the Colony uh, Motel. That's Dixie Highway today. It's still something else. <laughs> oh my gosh, you name it, it's there along Dixie Highway. And of course, uh, Waverly Hills is out in that area as well. Um, 
Waverly Hills, we know that as the ghost capital of the United States. This is their Christmas, if you will, with Halloween coming up. Uh, they do a lot of ghost tours and all that. I've been out there, I've not seen anything of interest, but uh, anyways, a lot of people talk about Waverly Hills. There's a nice view of it, kind of a ghostly view of it, if you will. It used to be an old tuberculosis sanatorium and uh, hundreds of people, maybe thousands, they say, died here due to that horrible disease. Okay, so those are the primarily uh, high points of uh, Louisville urban neighborhoods. But three major events really impacted our urban neighborhoods and really sent them into a spiral and into a decline. And they're just now recovering from all that. And we have, as I mentioned, a lot of great uh, revitalization going on. But I just wanted to, David, you let me know, and Bob, what you think of these three major events that I single out here that changed our urban neighborhoods. Number one was this. October 4th, 1898, the first horseless carriage comes into Louisville from Indianapolis. It was a Waverly, it was electric, believe it or not. Electric battery operated a horseless carriage. And within 10 years, there were 400 automobiles in Louisville. And only those who could afford automobiles bought them. And what did they do once they got their automobile? They moved out. Yeah, they moved to the east end, south end, wherever. But they decided they did not want to live in old Louisville anymore or some of these inner city neighborhoods and decided to move out. So that was impact. And we got the car. The next major impact was our flood, our 1937 flood, which really impacted the west end of Louisville, not so much the east end of Louisville, as you can tell by this flood area map. It really led to a lot of uh, those who once lived in West Louisville moving to East End, for instance, the people who built my house, they lived in the West End. Strange, they left in the mid-1930s and moved to the East End. The flood might have had something to do with that. But the flood really impacted our urban neighborhoods and people wanted to get the higher grounds, to the highlands, if you will. There's a view of the West End and some of the flooding that went on there. This is the old Ford assembly plant there. The Ohio River was right over here. Southwestern Parkway is right in that general area. And then another major impact, the third major impact was on June 29, 1956, President Eisenhower signed the Federal Aid Highway Act, which created the interstate highway system. And that's when we get the Waterson Expressway, we get uh, Gene Snyder Freeway and all of our interstates that nowadays you get on and sit there for a while because it seems like they're gridlocked all the time. <laughs> but uh, anyway, so those were my main three main things that impacted our urban neighborhoods which led to their decline, which I think now we've got a little renaissance coming back. People want to move back into the city and not spend half hour, 45 minutes, even an hour. Um, I'll never forget, I had a co-worker who moved to Louisville. He bought a house way out in Oldham County thinking that's where he needed to live. And then within a year or two he said, this is nuts, and he moved back into the inner city. But uh, yeah, me and my wife like living in the inner city because we hate spending time in the car. We like walking, we like uh, the inner city uh, activity, and uh, whenever I go out to the outer reaches of Louisville, it's just it's just a, an area that's foreign to me. I don't understand why people live out there. But that's another... I have a talk on that too, by the way. I have a suburban neighborhood talk, which maybe someday I can talk as well. So those are my three ma major impacts. Anything else that y'all might think that might have... I think busing had a lot to do with it too. Well, that was a lot of migration out of Jefferson mm -hmm. County. Yeah. Uh, that, uh, the busing back in the 1970s. 1970s. Yeah, that, that led... In fact, I was just over in southern Indiana, uh, Sellersburg area, I think I was in. Gosh, I get lost when I go to southern Indiana. It's a, you need a passport from Louisville to get to southern Indiana. But you would not believe the neighborhoods that are growing up in southern Indiana. It is amazing. Just drive to Sellersburg, and I, it blew my mind to see all these huge neighborhoods they're building in southern Indiana. 
So uh, yeah, that, that has something to do. Uh, JCPS, uh, it's a big issue. I won't get into that aspect of the discussion, but that has that has more to do with Jefferson County as a whole, not so much the inner city of Louisville. Any other comments? Yeah, Nancy. Uh, if I can make two comments, uh, you know, about, about the Castleman statue, I would hate to see the vandals win. I hate to see the vandals control over. Correct, correct. That's all I'm going to say. And my second comment is your, fir your first slide was the fall Falls of the Ohio. We just happened to go there on a Saturday at 1 o'clock, and there was a park ranger out there giving an excellent tour. The mm. water is down now. Mm -hmm. The water is not always down. And I think, double check me, but maybe this Saturday about 1 o'clock you can call the, the visitor center over there. And it was an excellent walk, and they have pyro washed some of the fossil beds to where you can actually see, well, I have have it on my phone. I was surprised how much you could see. Mm -hmm. And I've always heard about it and it was wonderful to see. Yeah. And then they have this one big fossil, which is kind of, you know, the fossils are kind of hard to see. They have this one big fossil, fossil is this big and it's on a lot of their advertisements and pamphlets and you can go see it today. It's just really a neat tour. So. Yeah, I've not actually been down to the fossil beds. That's good yeah, idea. well the water's down. Oh, it's well worth the effort. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Other comment? David, did you have a comment? Or mm -hmm. Anyone else have a comment? Well, I think one thing that changed a lot of things was urban renewal. Yeah, primarily the downtown area where we wiped out whole sections of downtown. Yeah, we, not, yeah, we, we destroyed whole residential neighborhoods and then uh, then you did have like the, wasn't the busing turnover? I mean, I lived in the West End. I saw the change in the West End, but the change in the West End was one of the things back to the automobile. The people started moving to Heights Point. <laughs> That's where everybody seemed to go was Heights Point. And so it left a vacuum there, which was filled by the people whose houses were destroyed. Uh, just the edge of downtown. We still bulldoze a lot of homes in this community. I want to say we bulldoze a thousand a year of homes in West End and the inner city. But fortunately, we have good developers, people that are coming in and, and buying the, up these dilapidated homes and revitalizing them. But the, yeah, the, uh, yeah, the automobile, I think, devastated more than anything else. But I will say, what Mayor George Ader wrote, uh, he said that the biggest thing he said that really hurt the West End was, like you said, the 37 flood. Mm -hmm. The people who would have gone there decided to go to St. Matthews. Yeah. Right. And, and the GE plant that was built in what, mid 50s? Mid 50s. Uh, Hikes Point and other areas developed around yeah. Fagan Bush Lane. Yeah. yeah, my parents moved out to Oklahoma because of the uh, GE plant. Yeah. Good point. Well, that's been great uh, feedback and everything. Any other comments? And this will be up on YouTube here in the next day or so, and you can go there to the Louisville Historical League YouTube page and view it there. I'm going to go ahead and turn.